Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today is September the 8th, in 2018. We welcome you here to the Congregation of Yahweh in Panama City, uh, Florida. <laughs> uh, and we welcome those who will see this message either by live streaming or by media. The title of the sermon today is Sabbath Day or Sunday, two words. Mankind receives infinite blessings continually from the Father Yahweh. And most of the time, people are oblivious to them. It's, they're not recognized. Yet, as I've said before, it is true. Uh, we need to consider just a very simple one, breathing. If you don't breathe, you're not blessed. You're dead. Y'all must receive this blessing uh, and others because they know the name, the sacred name of the Father and the Son. The Father's name is Yahweh, the Almighty Yahweh, and the Son's name, His only begotten Son, is Yeshua, and I always add the anointed one. The reason is, is because Jesus Christ, the Christ part, is not a second name, as many people think. Sunday keepers tomorrow believe it. Christ is from the Greek Christos, and it means anointed. Messiah in the Hebrew, Mashiach, means anointed. In English, the word is anointed. So is Yeshua, uh, and we know, and we esteem these names, and so we're, we seem to be blessed. Uh, we seem to know deeper things about Scripture than most. Few people today can grasp the boundless love of Yeshua the Anointed. He created all things in obedience to the will of his Father. Yeshua loves mankind so much that he willingly gave up his divinity, divinity, became mortal, and shed his precious blood to, attain, uh, to atone for mankind's sins. We always endeavor to be spiritual Israelites, obedient to the scriptures, and persevering in faith to the end of our lives or the age, whichever comes first. We pray that our Savior comes quickly. Search uh, seventh or first days. Some time ago, an advertisement was placed in a newspaper by the largest Sunday keeping church in town. The ad invited people to a media sermon titled Sabbath or Sunday. That church records each Sunday the service for its weekly television program for shut-ins and people who can't attend the service. However, when the airing began, something happened and it did not occur. A CD was obtained of the sermon. In the CD, the senior pastor mentioned that he had been uh, talking to a person and during the person, uh, during the conversation, the person made the statement, exclaimed, um, it's a sin to worship on Sunday. In response, the pastor decided to preach a sermon about it, saying that the matter of breaking the Sabbath came up from time to time. As the sermon progressed, the uh, pastor uh, seemed to be a little bit uh, annoyed uh, and that annoyance seemed to stem from just certain parts uh, of, that he was talking about. It almost seemed anti-Semitic. Included uh, in his sermon at the end quickly given because he dwelled a lot on other things in the beginning of the sermon is he gave some reasons 
why Sunday keeping uh, was true, you know, why it was not a problem. Well, um, somebody wrote the pastor a letter about his sermon, and he wrote it to say that he regretted exclaiming, he regretted someone exclaiming, it is a sin to worship on Sunday, because of course, one can worship on any day of the week. The writer mentioned <coughs> that the statement the person had made was incorrect. That person should have said, it is a sin to not worship on the Sabbath day. In retrospect, that statement was incorrect also. Why? Sin is defined in the scriptures at 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 as, quote, the transgression of the law, unquote. The law is the Ten Commandments, which is found in Exodus 30, uh, 20, and 1. The fourth commandment of that law says, to keep the Sabbath day holy. This is defined broadly as to rest or to cease from one's labor. Technically, the fourth commandment does not say one must worship on the Sabbath. We all assume it seems logical, but it doesn't say it. The reason proffered for in the CD sermon in support of Sunday keeping uh, are weak and easily refuted. Believers should be familiar with these reasons uh, to be able to refute them if needed. Verses in the scriptures which mention the Seventh-day Sabbath are many. All verses cited herein will be from the scriptures Bible, Bethel edition. Now it's a restored name Bible. The seventh day attacked. The words in the Old Testament book, Genesis 2, uh, chapter uh, verses 1 to 3, mention the creation week. Quote, and the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, Elohim finished his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And Elohim blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because that in it he rested from his work, which Elohim had created and made. The New Testament records that the seventh day Sabbath was observed by our Savior Yeshua, his apostles, by Paul, and that it was observed after the death of our Savior by the Apostolic Church Fathers, Polycarp, Arrhenius, and Clement, and by the Eastern Church at Jerusalem for several hundred years. This was not true of the Western Church at Rome. Ultimately, the official change in the day of rest from the seventh day to the first day was by an edict from the Roman Emperor Constantine. The edict was issued at the behest of the early Roman Catholic Church in Rome, but the history of the change has valuable lessons for Yavis. The history of the change is presented in great detail in the book From Sabbath to Sunday by Dr. Samuel Bacciocci. It will be excerpted extensively. Dr. Bacciocci was the only non-Catholic graduate from the Gregorian Pontifical University in Rome, Italy, and his 1977 doctoral thesis became his first book. Since then, Dr. Bacciocci has written 20 books. He also spoke internationally until his recent death. One of Bacciocci's other books, The Sabbath Under Crossfire, was especially written to address arguments against keeping the Sabbath. Sabbath keeping is not, uh, Sunday keeping is not scriptural. 
Sunday keeping is not mentioned in the scriptures. Sunday keeping is not mentioned in the scriptures. Accordingly, one would think Sunday keeping would immediately be recognized as unscriptural by the religious authorities and rejected. They, more than most, know the fourth commandment. Yet, regrettably, the very opposite has occurred. The Ten Commandments, which were written in stone by the very figure of the Almighty Yahweh, should be clear to everyone. Everyone should be in awe of them. They are the basis of English civil law and the civil law over most of the countries on this earth. The fourth commandment begins in Exodus 20 and 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of Yahweh your Elohim. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your manservant or your maidservant or your cattle or the stranger that is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, made it holy. The English word translated Sabbath in Strong's concor uh, Exhaustive Concordance is number 7676 and it is pronounced phonically as Shabbat. It and related words have similar definitions. An intermission, cessation, rest, repose, desist from exertion, and so forth. The verses record that the word translated rest in the commandment is the same word in Genesis describing the rest on the seventh day of creation. One can see that keeping the seventh day uh, Sabbath holy applied to those under the authority of the head of the household. And today, it would be analogous to an employer to employees. The fourth commandment is, speci is specific in that the seventh day is to be hallowed, that is, kept holy, a rest from man's labors for the entire 24-hour period. The Sabbath is not, quote, any day of the week, or close quotes, or, quote, one day in seven, close quotes. These are glib excuses from Sunday-keeping religious authority figures. The Sabbath day was made by the Almighty Yahweh for mankind. It is a sign between Yahweh and us. These words show how much he loves his creation. Delusions. Most Sunday keeping religious denominations claim that their church worships on the Christian Sabbath, quote unquote, or quote on the Lord's Day, end of quote, knowing full well that neither phrase is in the scriptures. The phrases seem tinged with anti-Semitism. They are excuses for not wanting to keep the Sabbath because of its use in Judaism. I know that sounds strange, but sometimes there are people who are anti-Semitic, claim they're not, but they're, they're the words in their voices and their congregation lead one to believe they may be slightly. The church leaders teach these excuses um, to their, I'm sorry. The church leaders teach these excuses to their members who believe and parrot them to others. Members assume the excuses are biblical since they come from within their own denomination. Accordingly, such members do not test the scriptures. 
they do not search out those phrases in, say, Strong's Concordance. When members are challenged by outsiders to produce explicit verses in support of the excuses, they cannot do so, and neither can their religious authority. It is, is it not curious that at the highest level in some so-called Bible-believing denomination, the leadership knows that they uh, don't obey the fourth commandment, it is a sin of disobedience, and it is occurring every Sunday. Just imagine, you know, we sit here and we know that salvation is not going to be given to the disobedient. You don't reward wrong, you reward right. And these people disobey the fourth commandment every Sunday, and it's worldwide. And yet they will make claims about salvation. They have it. There was some incident in their life, and they can re repeat it in detail. And yet, it just doesn't dawn uh, on people that they commit a sin every time they don't keep the Sabbath holy. For those who do know and do keep the Sabbath, it means keeping the Sabbath, the whole period. Sunday keeping denominations, um, I'm sorry, is it not curious that at the highest level in some Bible believing denomination, the leadership does not obey the fourth commandment? It is a sin of disobedience. Uh, this occurred in the first two centuries of the common era, CE. Um, the same thing, and I will recount instances in just a moment to prove this. Sunday keeping denominations and their members should obey the scriptures as written and be obedient to what Yahweh's inspired words command. But denomination members themselves have no excuse. After all, each has access to at least one Bible, usually several. They are readily available free and in many languages. Responsibility for Sunday keeping. Most Sunday keepers are unaware that the early Roman Catholic Church was largely, but not totally, behind the change in the day of rest from the Sabbath day to Sunday. The Roman Catholic Church publicly has publicly claimed that they have the power and the authority to change the day of rest from the Sabbath to Sunday. Details of this claim is reproduced in the Seventh-day Adventist publication titled Rome's Challenge. The so-called Bible-believing, Sunday-keeping denominations know it was the Roman Catholic Church that was largely responsible for changing the day of rest. Yet, there is great reluctance by them to even consider a change back to Yahweh's commanded Seventh-day Sabbath. It's incredible. How can they expect blessings how can they expect, expect answered prayer? How can they expect healing? How can they expect salvation if they don't keep the commandments? If they purposely sin knowingly? A Sunday keeping pastor who would return to the commanded seventh day Sabbath would, lose, would risk loss of his job. Changing back to the commanded Seventh-day Sabbath for corporate worship is not a possibility in most pastors' minds, even though it is a commandment directly from their own creator. Pastoral letter mistake. In the book Sabbath Under Crossfire, Dr. Bacciochi mentions one reason for his writing the book was the May 31st 
1998 pastoral letter, De Domini, from Pope John Paul II. The pastoral letter contains the late Pope's concern about falling attendance at Roman Catholic churches on Sunday. It is occurring worldwide, especially in Europe. His simplistic solution was to, to, was to garner support to have Sunday keeping legislated into law, which of course here would be against the Constitution. In the second chapter of the pastoral letter titled Des Christi, John Paul II states that the Gospels of Mark 16.2 and 9, Luke 24 and 1, and John 20 and 1 show the resurrection took place, quote, on the first day after the Sabbath, end quote. Well, I'm going to read those now. Mark 16, quote, And very early on the first day of the week came to the tomb, they came to the tomb near sunrising, end of quote. Mark 16, 9, now when he had been raised early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Miriam of Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Luke 24, 1. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. End of quote. John 21, quote, now on the first day of the week comes Miriam Magdalene early while it was yet dark to the tomb and sees the stone taken away from the tomb. Close quotes. It is a very common mistake to assume the resurrection occurred early Sunday morning. It is perpetuated by people who do not realize that the days uh, described in Genesis began in darkness, nor how the lunar solar scriptural year is determined, nor how days, months, and years were reckoned. The Bible and the knowledge to determine the lunar solar scriptural year enable one to determine the date on which Passover occurred within the years 26 CE to 34 CE. This range of years was chosen because the scriptures mentioned that Yeshua was about 30 years old when he started his three and a half year ministry. The range of years given, uh, the range of years given spanned the date of Yeshua's death. It occurred on Passover, Wednesday, Nisan 14, CE 31 Julian. This corresponds to April the 25th. The time of death would have been about mid-afternoon. Yeshua was entombed just before sunset that same day. Passover was on a Wednesday. He was entombed just before sunset on a Wednesday that same day. Wednesday, uh, Yeshua's own prophecy about how long he would be entombed is in Matthew 12, 40, which says, quote, which he says, quote, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That is a specific period of 72 hours. Yeshua's prophecy about himself proves he arose just before sunset of the weekly Sabbath. Friday to Saturday, Friday, I'm sorry, Wednesday to Thursday, Thursday to Friday, Friday to Saturday, three days. He was already risen on the first day of the week when Miriam of Magdala came to the tomb. 
It is commonly but erroneously taught that Yeshua's death occurred on the afternoon of, quote, Good Friday, and his resurrection took place early, quote, Easter Sunday morning. That interval is only about 36 hours, yet this mathematical discrepancy is very seldom questioned. When the math discrepancy is questioned, the parroted response is usually, quote, they counted parts of days and nights, end of quote, as if the responding person was there. Can't find anything about there, anyone counting parts of days and parts of nights. That is a glib response not supported by facts. Yet, none can cite verifiable proof to support that statement. The paper titled Rationale for the Date of Yeshua the Anointed's Death shows how the United States Navy Observatory's website can be used to determine the specific Passover when Yeshua died. Passover then was called the Preparation, Preparation Day, Preparation for the annual Sabbath, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 15 of Sam. Luke 23, 54 shows that Yeshua was entombed as, and if you can imagine brackets and the word annual in the brackets. Luke 23, 54 shows that Yeshua was entombed as the annual Sabbath drew on. And this would have taken place just before the sunset of Passover. Most people incorrectly assume the entombment occurred on Friday and that the weekly Sabbath, uh, and that the Sabbath was the weekly Sabbath. This is easily proved wrong. It was an annual Sabbath. It was the high day in John 30, uh, 1931. In John 1931, it says, an high day. It was, of course, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a high day. According to Yeshua's own prophecy about himself, he would have risen 72 hours after his atonement. This would have occurred just before sunset of the weekly Sabbath. Scripture shows Miriam of Magdala indeed came to the tomb early uh, Sunday morning, but Yeshua was not there because he had already risen the end of the weekly Sabbath. The verse in the Bible proves that the Pope and millions of others are wrong when they assume that resurrection took place on Sunday morning. <laughs> Sometimes when uh, that statement is said uh, before Catholics, and having been one, I can tell you, it is, it is, it strike, it's like they're being struck by lightning, uh, or me being struck by lightning. It is, uh, it is un, just, the Pope is infallible. You can't question anything that the Pope says. Well, I got news for you. If you're outside of Catholicism, you'll find that isn't true. <coughs> common excuses for Sunday keeping. Verses which are commonly cited as excuses for keeping Sunday instead of the seventh day Sabbath include Acts 20 and 7. Paul and his followers had indeed gathered to break bread, which is an idiom for eating a common meal. Paul was obviously not preaching a Sunday worship service. Nothing in the verse indicates the meal was communion. And you hear this all the time. Well, hey, right there, you had a, had a meal, that's communion. No, it wasn't. Corinthians 16.1. The verse mentions a collection which took place on the first day of the week, which then was a common work day. The collection likely consisted of foodstuffs and so forth to be shipped to the suffering believers in Jerusalem 
since Paul was about to sail away. Now, there might have been a little money in there, but this was not tithing. This was not Sunday collection. Hardship could occur in Israel every seventh year during the land Sabbath and before the spring harvest in the eighth year. It was not a Sunday service nor offering in the usual sense. Leviticus 16.16 16. This verse requires Israelite males to give a tenth of their increase three times a year at Jerusalem during the temple's era, i.e. not every Sunday. The three times correspond with the spring harvest of barley at Passover, the summer harvest of wheat at the Feast of Weeks, and the autumnal harvest of grapes at the Feast of Tabernacles. These three commonly cited verses fail to prove Sunday keeping was practice in New Testament times. Contrast those few verses with the many verses where the observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath is mentioned in the Old and New Testament. Yeshua obediently observed the fourth commandment of his Father. Scriptures record that Paul's uh, during Paul's travel, the first place he went was to the synagogue. This was because he knew from childhood that services would occur on the seventh day weekly Sabbath, not on the first day of the week. According, um, according to the book, uh, Which Day is the Sabbath of the New Testament by Herbert W. Armstrong, the scriptures record that Paul kept 84 Sabbaths. 84 Sabbaths. Rome's challenge. In the letter to the local pastor previously mentioned, a booklet titled Rome's Challenge was included. The booklet reproduced four editorials that originally appeared in the Catholic Mirror, Baltimore, Maryland, September 2nd, 9th, 16, and 23, 8. 1993. The editorials were authored by Cardinal Gibbons, Baltimore, Maryland, or somebody under his official sanction. In summary, the editorials es essentially state worship on, the, on Sunday is solely because of the, quote, power and authority, unquote, of the Roman Catholic Church, that nowhere in the Bible does it teach worship on Sunday? And it is dishonest to say it does. The Roman Catholic Church challenges Protestant churches which claim their religion is based solely upon the Bible to thereafter worship on the Sabbath day. If same continue to worship on Sunday, it is de facto recognition of the Roman Catholic Church's power and authority to change the day of worship. Well, they have not challenged it. Sunday keeping prayfully should, Sunday keepers prayfully should ponder these facts. It has been 115 years since the editorials appeared in the Catholic Mirror, yet the challenge by the Roman Catholic Church has essentially gone unanswered by Sunday-keeping Protestant churches. Apparently, the Protestant denominations agree that the Roman Catholic Church does indeed have the power and authority to maintain the change from Sabbath to Sunday. These same denominations do not seem willing to challenge the authority of the Roman Catholic Church and return to Sabbath day worship. Since Constantine's edict and CE 321, it has been 1,697 years since the official change from the seventh day Sabbath to Sunday. That's a long time. And it's a long time 
for this for the uh, fourth commandment to be violated. Origin of Sunday keeping. Dr. Bacciocci researched the possibility of Sunday keeping in the early church at Jerusalem. He concluded that it was futile to search for the origin of Sabbath keeping among the early Christian converts because of their loyalty to Jewish religious practices such as keeping the Sabbath. The historical events that follows will usually indicate a common error time reference in parentheses. The events uh, described are grouped by topic, so will not be necessarily in chronological order. After the destruction of the Second Temple in CE 70, and leading up to the destruction of the city of Jerusalem by Adrian in CE 135, Rome ruthlessly cr crushed the Barcovia revolt in CE 132 to 135 and destroyed the residential area of Jerusalem. A new Roman city was built on the ruins. It was named Aelia Capulina in honor of Emperor alias Adrian. At that time, harsh restrictions were imposed on the Jews. They were expelled from Aelia and forbidden to re-enter it and prohibited from practicing their religion, particularly the seventh-day Sabbath and circumcision. Rabbinical sources also mention prohibitions of festivals and prohibition of studying the Torah. These repressive measures taken by the emperor against the Jews affected the general attitude of Jewish converts toward their fellow Jews, especially affected was the ethnic composition uh, and theological orientation of the church at Jerusalem. As a result of Adrian's edict, there was a change of the 15 bishops of the circumcision. Whenever you see that of the circumcision, you can insert the word Jews because that's what it means. They were replaced by bishops who were Gentiles. Eusebius reports that the first Gentile bishop was a Greek named Marcus. The Gentile bishops maintained the same practices as before up to CE 135. However, by that time the church had lost its political and religious prestige. Nothing much is reported by historians about the Jerusalem church in the second century. Over this same period, a chasm between the Church of the East and the West was developing. Ultimately, the Church of the East refused to accept the decree of the Council of Nicaea of the West for uh, reckoning the date of Passover, arguing that they followed the Apostles' example and authority by observing Passover on the San 15, uh, 14, not Easter Sunday. This difference came to be known as the Quattro Dicemian controversy. <coughs> Quattro Dicemian is 14. -er. Paul's epistles to the Romans in chapter 11 and 13 show he was speaking to a church composed of Gentiles. He was in Rome and he was talking to people who <coughs> were from Rome. These Gentiles were formerly pagan Paul says, quote, I am speaking to you Gentiles, quote. As he greeted believers, he mentions their Greek name or Latin name. The names by themselves do not prove that the Gentiles were in the majority because some Jews preferred such names. But Jewish converts were clearly in the minority in Rome. The predominance of Gentile members and their conflict uh, with the Jews inside and outside the church located in Rome seemed to have resulted in a differentiation between the two commu communities earlier there than in the East. Further developing chasm 
occurred between the Roman church and the synagogue. According to the Roman historian Suetonius, CE 70 to 122, in the year CE 49, Emperor Claudius had, quote, expelled the Jews from Rome since they rioted constantly at the instigation of Christus, end of quote. Acts 18.2 recommends, uh, mentions that Aquila and Priscilla, although converted Jews, were expelled uh, from Rome along with the other Jews. According to Tacitus, CE 35 to 120, 14 years after the expulsion of the Jews, Emperor Neo, Nero, quote, fastened the guilt for his burning of Rome and afflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abomination called Christians, end quote, by the population. He did so perhaps to please the Jews since he married Papina Sabina, Papia Sabina, uh, a Jewish proselyte and friend of the Jews. It is a fact that the Jewish residential district of Trasfertur in Rome was not touched by the fire. The Christian did not forget the role paid by the Jews in the first imperial and bloody persecution they <laughs> suffered and the fathers did not hesitate to attribute to them the responsibility of having <coughs> incited Nero to persecute the, crypt, the Christians. According to F.F. F. Bruce, quote, by 64 CE, the Christians were clearly differentiated at Rome, end of quote. This is thought by some to be about when the Christians would have begun to think about Sunday keeping to distance themselves from the Sabbath and other practices of the Jews. The Sunday was observed by Romans in honor of the pagan deity Mithra. The Romans under Nero had previously not only recognized Judaism, but had to a large extent shown respect for their religious principles. Judaism uh, had experienced a fable position under Nero. After the death of Nero, the Jews soon afterwards became unpopular in the empire. Primarily, it was because of their resurgent nationalistic feelings which exploded in violent uprising almost everywhere, Mesopotamia, Cyrena, Palestine, Egypt, and Cyprus. Believers were often victims of the outbursts of Jewish violence, seemingly because the Jews regarded them as traitors to the Jewish faith and political aspiration, and because believers outpaced the Jews in the conversion of the pagans. The Romans came to react against the Jews militarily, fiscally and literally, because of their numerous riots and insurrections. There were anti-Jewish riots in Alexandria, Caesarea, and Antioch. Under Vespasian, CE 69 to 70, both the Sanhedrin and the office of the high priest were abolished. The worship at the temple site was forbidden. Moreover, Vespasian outlawed the practice of the Jewish religion, particularly the observance of the Sabbath. This patient also introduced the ficus judaicus, or Jewish tax, which was intensified by Domitian in CE 81 to 96. According to S.W. Barron, the growing Christian community secured from Emperor Nervia in CE 96 to 98, exemption from the fiscus judicious tax, which indirectly obtained for them official recognition of the severance of ties with the Jewish denomination. Later, Hadrian in CE 117 to 138 intensified the ficus judicious, 
judicious tax, judicious tax. The amount collected by the half shuffle tax was insignificant. The tax was clearly discriminatory uh, Tory, and likely the result of punishment on the Jews, a form of punishment on the Jews. The tax marked the beginning of the social deterioration of the Jews in Roman society. Introduction, uh, introduction of Sunday in place of the Jewish Sabbath, quote unquote, might have been a measure taken by leaders of the Church of Rome to show their severance from Judaism and thereby avoid the payment of a discriminatory tax. Literary opposition to the Sabbath. Justin Martin, CE 100 to 165, taught and wrote in Rome. By the middle of the second century, he began to literally upbraid Sabbath keeping by Jews. Prior to him, Ignatius in Asia Minor, CE 110, and Barnabas at Alexander in CE 135 had explicitly upbraided Sabbath keeping in their writings. But it was Justin Martin who wrote the most devastating and systematic condemnation <coughs> of the Sabbath and the first explicit account of worship on Sunday. About the same time, the no renowned heretic Marcion, CE 144, established his headquarters at Rome. The influence of Marcion's anti-Judaic and anti-Sabbath teaching was felt as far as Persia and Armenia with surprising rapidity, surpassing in extension and importance all other Gnostic groups. Marcion was later expelled from the Catholic, uh, from the Church of Rome because of his dualistic Gnostic views. Imposition of fasting to suppress Sabbath keeping. Fasting on the Sabbath came to be used to put down the Jews. Fasting was not done on the Sabbath by Jews who felt the day should be a joyful one. Fasting was imposed to make the Sabbath a time of sadness and hunger upon the Jewish and pagan converts to wean them away from Sabbath keeping and all things Jewish. Sunday keeping was promoted by the Church of Rome as a time of joy. The early church played an important key role in emptying the Sabbath of its theological and liturgical significance and in urging the abandonment of, the, of its observance of the Sabbath. It is astonishing that seemingly no one stands out in history as having protested these efforts, nor cited the monumental fact that the fourth commandment came directly from Yahweh himself. The fiscal, military, political, and literary tax and measures against the Jews encouraged Christians to sever their ties with them. This was especially true in Rome where most of the converts were pagans. The change of the date and the number of what would seem to be Jewish things, such as the Sabbath and Passover, would help clarify to the authority the distinction of the Roman church versus Judaism. Easter Sunday originated under Pope Sixtus in CE 116 to 126. The word Easter is a corruption of the name E-A-S-T-R-E, -E, Easter, the Saxon goddess of dawn. Easter Sunday was put in place by the Roman church to oppose the observance of Passover, which was regarded as Jewish. Now think about that for a minute. Here they take the name of a pagan deity and they insert it into their religious beliefs. It's incredible. A pagan deity. But it stuck. Denigrating Passover was yet another way to distance the Roman church <coughs> from the Jews and the eyes of the Roman emperor. Easter was originally observed on the Sunday following Passover, the date of which varied. 
Initially, the date of Easter was dependent upon the date of Passover, which date had to be obtained from the Jews each year. This was because the day of Passover is based on the lunar solar calendar. Later, Roman officials repudiated the date obtained from the Jews and determined their own. Today, the Roman Catholic Church determines Easter as being the first Sunday which occurs after the full noon, moon on or after March the 21st, which, for those who don't know, is the uh, spring equinox. It varies slightly, but that's generally taken as the date of the spring equinox. Obligatory observance of Easter Sunday by the church in the West caused the Quattro de Simeon Passover controversy. The Eastern Church refused to observe uh, Easter Sunday and continued to observe Passover on Nisan 14 as determined by the lunar solar year using the first new crescent moon seen after that vernal equinox. In conclusion, History shows that the nationalistic aspirations of the Jews in the first two centuries of the Common Era prompted widespread violent behavior. That caused the Jews and things connected with them, such as the Sabbath day, uh, Passover, and so forth, to be hated by the Roman emperors. The same were also hated by the early Western church whose members suffered at their same fate, at the same fate as the Jews because they practiced the same things. The Western Church began to distance itself from the Jews by substituting Sunday keeping for the seventh day Sabbath and Easter Sunday for Passover. On March the 7th, 321 CE, Emperor Constantine issued an edict that officially changed the day of rest to Sunday and the uh, uh, from the seventh day Sabbath. He did not, he uh, did this at the behest of the then Roman Catholic Church. We should take every opportunity to provide the facts about keeping the seventh day Sabbath. That day, reckoned from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, was given to mankind by the Almighty Yahweh as a sign between he and us. Thank you.